All right. All right, so I'll start off here. Uh, hey folks, welcome to the Battles of the First World War podcast. When I first began podcasting with the Verdun episodes way back in the day, one of my hopes was to put a spotlight on the World War I French army and its bravery in the face of a nearly impossible situation. Being able to get back to the Poilus and their experience in the First World War is an absolute pleasure. And with me this afternoon, evening from the UK, is Alex Lyons, who you might know on Twitter as RI315E. And if you didn't know, Alex looks nothing like his Twitter profile, which is actually his great grandfather. So RI315E stands for, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, uh, Regiment d'Infanterie 315 e or the 315th Infantry Regiment. How'd I do there? Pretty good. Cool. So Alex is a fellow member of the Great War Group run by the power duo Alexandra Churchill and Beth Moore. And he has been for some time now tweeting something truly remarkable the letters of his great-grandfather, a Poilu in the Great War of 1914 to 1918. And it's not just the letters, it's that Alex has been cross-referencing the places and battles mentioned in these letters. It's all on Twitter for now, and it's a really ground-level look into how Frenchmen faced one of their country's darkest episodes. So Alex, welcome to the podcast, and if you would, please do tell us about yourself. Perfect. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for thank you for such a, such an introduction. I mean, it, it, by the way, I find it very bizarre. Back, in, I remember back in 2014, 15, listening to your Verna podcast, and never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be on one. <laughs> never in my never in my wildest dreams did I expect anybody to actually listen to them. So this is like <laughs> <laughs> so in, in that respect, it's thank you very much for for having me, and hopefully we can talk about the French army. Uh, talk about well, I dare I, I I'm never sure if I should use the word poilu, uh, knowing the fact that the soldiers never like the like, like the term uh, themselves. Right. So, uh, but yeah, um, hopefully. A bit of education for everybody on what the French got up to, and it wasn't just uh, being on mutiny and giving up. Right. No, there was a lot of like the, the um, when I think of the the French army in World War One. I, um, I know, like here in the U.S., we you know we're we're colored by the World War Two experience and of France surrendering, um, but very very different story in World War One. I. I mean, like uh, like we were we've actually been talking for. Uh, almost an hour before we just started recording <laughs> like uh <laughs> but just the the french effort like when i think of the french army in world war one I, I think of of uh bravery um and sacrifice and, and an incredible bloodletting uh in in that country i think um i have a cousin who lives in um, paris and he he has grown up, his his um, parents were Portuguese immigrants to France, but he has grown up, essentially he's he's French. Um, and even him just, just going through the French schooling system and, and, you know, being immersed in French culture, like I remember he told me, um, like, you know, it, it was a very traumatic experience for France. And um, it's like, wow, yeah, even, even, you know, we have no one in our family who served in the French army, of course, but like even my cousin, you know, several generations removed understands that it's still a, a very, very big thing in 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 French um in, in French culture. So we have an incredible um ground eye view here um in into the, the French side of things in the war. And so um but first real quick so you you're not a historian. No you, you're not getting rich on World War One. So you're you you have a day job. You don't have to tell us what it is. Um, so, but uh, like many of us, uh, we we all ha we all have to have a day job to keep the lights on. <laughs> yep, that's correct. <laughs> so, so Alex, my so part time hobby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just just like here, the obsession, you know. So, um, so very cool, very cool. So we'll we'll get right into it, man. Okay, 
So if you would, Alex, please tell us about Jules-André de Stigneville, your great-grandfather. Was he a large figure in the history of your family? Yes, I mean, it, it, it's a bizarre one because the family on that side of my family, just to kind of give people an idea why they're not hearing somebody who's got an outrageous French accent, um, it's... My my dad my dad is English, so you can't get more English than than him in terms of he he grew up in in Peckham in London, and people who know uh, London will 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 know that area very well. And my mum is obviously French, and she she was born in uh, actually ironically was born in Dijon, but m m lived the majority of her life obviously in Paris. So that's where you have that wonderful blend of. Uh, of France and the, and the UK that come together. And on my mum's side, it's a, it's a very small family. There's not a huge number of kids, grandkids, etc. So it, when you kind of look at it and go, him as an individual in terms of large and life, in terms of a large part of the family, well, he wasn't particularly large in terms of himself because uh, he was only one metre 71. Uh, so he was kind of an average, average height uh, for that kind of, uh, for that period. But as an individual, what's been great is my mum knew him. So in that sense, it gives me a, an amazing character reference uh, throughout all of this. Oh, and man. to be fair, another part which is, which is really important in all of this is knowing the individual. When you're reading these letters, reading postcards, is understanding, is this an individual who may like to exaggerate things? Is this somebody who is a very gregarious individual? No. From speaking with my mum, he was very much a quiet person, but a very gentle, kind man. And I think that's important. But also when you look at his background as well, he was also a police officer. So as a police officer, it gives you an idea, this person is very straight-laced and is not going to be somebody who's going to be making things up in letters, as we all know, when you read, uh, when you when you read any diaries and letters, some people may like to exaggerate things, but we can be pretty sure. And the, also, I have the ability, obviously, to cross-reference with regimental journals. So when he says something, I can actually also see if it is true as well. Um, he's pretty much bang on most of the time. So as an individual, very quiet. I don't want to say not uh, unassuming, but in that sense, that kind of the normal kind of your first world war veteran in that sense, from what my, my mom has told me as well, he's not somebody who would talk about the war either. Like many of the, many of many of the veterans, he would from time to time around Christmas after a couple of drinks, but that's about it. Um, if I look to others, my, my grandfather on my, on my mother's side, he would talk more, but he was part of the second world war generation. And his war was, I don't want to say comedy value, but it kind of was <laughs> for him. He wanted right. to be part of the army. He wanted to be part of it, but never could and just ended up um, having to do labour, uh, forced labour in Germany. So, again, it's interesting to see how different generations also talk about things. My God, that's that's um, um, fantastic. I hadn't even, I having read what you sent me on, on your great-grandfather, Jules, um, I know he was a police officer, but I, um, I didn't, I, I didn't put that together. You know, like that, that as a result, you're going to get a guy who's going to, who's going to have more of a tendency to write things like just the facts, mm -hmm. ma'am. You know, this is yep. what I see. This is what's happening. And, and now thinking of, of his letters, the excerpts and everything, it's like, yeah, he's, there's just a little bit of grumbling in there to be expected. He, he you know, didn't really care for, for, you know, he, he didn't choose being a soldier as his career. So, you know, um, but, uh, but other than that, like he just, he did what he had to do. Yeah. Oh, that's wow, man. Wow. All right. Um, and that's fantastic. And, and about how long, like your mom, how long did your mother know him? Like, was, like, was your mother like, uh, I assume probably like a, a teenager when, when he passed away or, or did you get to know him very well? No, she got to, got to know him pretty well. Um, I actually knew, well, I, when I say knew, I was about one or two. I knew my great grandmother, so Jeanne, who is the person that he was reading to, mm -hmm. is, and there's actually a photo which I need to find of me uh, sitting on her lap. 
um, which kind of is the weird parallel of bringing everything together. Yes. But no, he he actually, um, she, she would have known him for, for quite a number of years. So in that sense, it's also good as well to see kind of the evolution because he died. Uh, and again, my mum will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but in the around, in the, I believe it was around the night in the 1970s. So there was a good there was a good number of uh, good number of years crossover in that sense. OK, wow. OK, so she got to know him really, really well, really well. It's enough to, like you said, to pick up on like who, who he was, his the content yeah. of his character and everything. Awesome. So how did you how did you, Alex, come across um, his letters? And um, I think we've we just answered the question, but of course they were they were mostly addressed to to your great grandmother, right, Jean? Correct. So they they would they were predominantly well, hundred percent all um, addressed to her, uh, Jeanne, who was his soon to be wife. Um, and obviously, spoiler alert, uh, <laughs> they got they got they got married. It, it all worked letter... out in the end, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, it all worked out in the end. Um, but the letters in itself is quite, it's, it's a weird one. I kind of look at it, it's bookended by podcast in that sense. Wow. In that you kind of look at when it was back in like 19, in, in 2014, 2015, um, I was listening to your podcast about Verdun and I went to Verdun um, in 2015 with a, with a mate of mine uh, from school. But I went there just with zero knowledge of him I, I, the only knowledge i went with was just knowing he'd been to Verda, and that was it okay but i did know that we had in the family we had a lot of his equipment because i remember as a as a child um seeing his adrian helmet um which we obviously have his water bottle his car so the car was their little cup um that they used to drink out of and also medals and uh, other documentation so I knew that was there, but I was less aware of the letters and the postcards. Postcards, I knew we had a load of postcards because so I'd seen a postcard album. But, okay. you know, as you do, you look at a postcard album and think, great, these are postcards. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Until you realise it's his wartime correspondence behind. Right. And then with the letters as well. And then with, um, and then basically how it then kind of evolved. And again, it's kind of a process, I'd say, in my head but also just in general in that my my grandparents had a second home in burgundy which with the passing of my grandfather um in 2016 there was there was no point really having that house any anymore and that got sold and that also kind of exposed these documents again okay which from my perspective i don't think anybody had read since the war these documents um because we may maybe a couple of times documents these letters had been opened but myself nor my mum knew really the contents of them and so that was kind of discovered and that was then taken to paris and then again left there in paris um and then in at the end of 2019 uh, my grandmother died and then that obviously then you hit covid period and that was also the point so my mum was kind of going through all these documents, going through all these items. And then with COVID, I was sitting there going, I've watched every Netflix episode out there. I've watched everything there is on Amazon Prime. I need to find a hobby. As you'll know, with kids, it's kind of like the days were just becoming the same. I was like, mm -hmm. I just need something in the evening just to do something different. Yep. And that's where it kind of all came about. And then I also then listened to a, a podcast from Paul Reed on, um, on Verdun. It was actually on Dormont, ironically on Dormont Fleury, which I would subsequently, subsequently find out uh, was were areas of, of of interest, and that could basically started it all. Um, and then with my mum, and my mum has been great helping us because with a job I don't have time to do right. uh, to just look at these letters which are written in pencil and pretty much going with a magnifying glass, having to read things because. You can imagine these these letters are written in the trenches. They're 106, seven years old, written in pencil, written at 2 a.m. by the candlelight in a shelter in a frontline trench. You can imagine it's not the best writing either. Um, so in that respect, uh, that's how it all, all, in a long kind of long winded way, how it all came about. You can say that COVID kind of brought it 
it all together in a way that, well, let's find out what he did. Wow. Wow, man. Wow. I had no idea. I had no idea of, of any of this. I've been following you from for some time on Twitter, but not um, not not since the very beginning. So, wow, this is too cool. So to start off the story of of Jules, he had a uh, typical experience for, for most French and European men. Um, and by that, I mean that, you know, he was born in France. He went through schooling. When he came of age, he, you know, it was time for him to do his mandatory military service. Um, now, what was um, what was that like for him? And how did Jules take um, to the life of a soldier? So, I mean, he was he was lucky in a way. Um, he had the uh, he had the joy of doing his military service just before Joffre. Uh, instigated in July uh, 1913 the increase of military service going to three years Ooh. so one one thing that obviously people forget about Joff that something rather critical that he did back in uh, 1913 so he he finished his military service in uh, 1912 and he was with the 79th regiment uh, based out in in Nancy the reality is it seems as though he did it because he had to do it. Let's be honest about it. And the fact that he didn't cr continue his career in the army and went straight to the police force, I think kind of gives you an idea that he didn't see that as being his future, his future job. There's also very interesting in a lot of his letters, especially when he's going through his training, his remobilization, he talks a lot about how those days back in the caserne how they were so dull and how it's now dull again, having to re-go really through all of this again. I remember, um, I believe in one of the letters he writes about how uh, he was, you know, he re he remembered counting the hours in, in his first enlistment of, uh, you know, waiting until he could he could be done. <laughs> so yeah. he could get back to his life, you know. Literally um, counting down the days until he would be done. Little did he know. <laughs> that uh, three years later uh, he would he would be back uh, back in the I was about to say the same uniform but um, he definitely wasn't in the same uniform but that can, that that's a story for later <laughs> right right and now so if you folks are, are out there listening okay so um, uh, Jules finishes his um, his first initial compulsory military service in in 1912 correct was correct yes okay so 1912 so he doesn't three years later as alex just said so there's so we're talking 1915 now of course we know you know world war one began the year prior so this leads to um my next uh point here which was jewel wasn't part of that initial mobilization in August of 1914. And why was that? We've actually already mentioned why, but we'll tie it all together now. Yeah, so obviously 19, 1914, uh, you obviously get the, the mobilization. I mean, it swelled the ranks to, uh, it was around 2.9 million. So in that sense, it, it did what it needed to do, the mobilization. But at the same time, it was a mobilization of, let's get many as many people as possible mobilized which would create a problem down the line on the policing side there was a at least a thought which was the correct thought to do to go it's maybe not a good idea if we go and send all of our police officers to the th front and then we're left with nobody left to actually police the streets yep. so that's the reason why he got an exemption for the first year in that he wasn't part of that initial mobilization and why he then got uh, mobilized um, in August 1915. All right. So that actually, um, who knows, like the, these little small little events, you know, probably led to his, you know, to, to his long term survival. Um, there's a huge number of those where just even reading letters, there's small, small details, even uh, moving 10 meters one way or the other, right. which uh, would have meant life or death. Right, right. So many stories like that. Okay, so now, and this, and this is one that, like, this, I, I kind of can't wait to hear your answer on this one. So, 
So Jules is called up in 1915, um, and eventually he's assigned to the 315th Infantry. So that's where, you know, Alex gets his Twitter handle, RI315E. Um, so the 315th Infantry Regiment was a reserve regiment, um, but it was, uh, I use the word tied for lack of a better word. It was tied to an active regiment in the French Army, the 115th infantry so uh alex if you could could you explain how that whole system worked <laughs> for, for once i would say in the french army it's actually simple enough to understand the, the french <laughs> army likes to do things that are often quite com in a complex or convoluted way this time it's actually done in, in quite a good way i think the one thing to first remember for everybody who listens to this and hears reserve they kind of automatically start thinking World War II, Dad's Army, and these very old old men who are half incompetent um, and half they should actually be pensioned off. It, it's right. not at all. It's not at all that. I mean, it, you just look at Joff's quote. Uh, I think it's from 1915, where he mentions there's no such thing as reserves because a reserve and an active regiment, they call it, they used to fight side by side because right. they were seen as being the same. And you'll see that later on when we talk about things like the 25th of um, September, 1915, where the 315 was the primary regiment in that attack. And there was active regiments that were supporting them as the primary regiment. So looking at reserve regiments, well, it, again, it, it, just to give people a kind of a bit of background where it, where it kind of came from, it came, it started in July 1892 I think uh, where they basically changed the amount of time that soldiers had to stay in reserve so they increased it to 10 years and that created a bit of a problem with regiments then having to create this kind of a mixed regiment of people who are active and and people who are reserved within the same regiment so by 1888 they realized that this was a problem scrapped it and that's what created the reserve regiment i.e you had your active regiment and then siloed on the side was your reserve regiment. And the reserve regiment was basically individuals between 25 and 30. That age would change uh, as the war would go, would go on. But roughly that gives you an idea. And also at the same time, these are people who've just been through military service. So saying they're 25 to 30 gives you an idea. These people aren't completely useless or completely incompetent. These are people who have done full um military service over either two or three years so in that sense they know what they're doing and why it be, why is it known as the 315 well it's actually quite simple because the active regiment is the 115 the reserve regiment is the 315 so all you need to do is you just add 200 so any regiment you see out there for example you have the fifth regiment d'infanterie you add 200, well, you've got what their reserve what their reserve uh, regiment was. Yeah. And it's the same then when you look at also the battalions below. So you've got an active regiment would have battalion one, two, and three. Okay. And the reserve would have battalion four and five. Apart from the 315 who went a bit different and had just battalion five and six and wait until July 1915 until the fourth battalion turned up. Who knows why, but that was that was how they went about it. That like these sorts of little things like this, this is the type of stuff that I love to tell my family about. Like, like, do you know how the French like did their their reserve regiment numbering system? It's fascinating, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, it's not so fascinating to them. But but, you know, we're in good company here and with everybody listening. Um, so Jules wrote home. To, to Jean about um, the drudgery of, of army life. And we hear often of, you know, the, the French poilu in, in combat and, and in the trenches, um, but what was his life like on a daily basis? And, and by this, I mean, like, not necessarily in the front line, but like maybe even like the support trenches um, or or um, what what the French would call the la, la Arie de, de la Arie, am I correct? Like the rear of the rear. So, so all of like in those areas away from mm -hmm. danger or immediate danger, like the food, the pay, the daily duties. Um, what was all of that like for Jules? 
I mean, it, it, it wasn't great. Um, there's no there's no other way of really of really describing it. I actually wrote on a notepad here. I kind of wrote three words: rats, fleas, and trenches. Um, it which kind of su- sums it up. But as, as we were speaking earlier, I was, I was chatting to Peter Hart yesterday, and his comment was around, for example, what was the French experience like? And he just said, "God, it was terrible." <laughs> seriously yeah and and i think that that says everything and i kind of break it down as you as you kind of said the pay they were the worst paid on the western front i mean that just that just let, let's get that out out there straight away um the pay in terms of how it was set up i mean we could probably do a whole podcast on that uh it was so complex wow. they it was set up around you had to have certain amounts of experience if you had had for example contact with the enemy um, if you had done additional training courses, that added extra bits to your paycheck. But again, hugely complex to kind of understand. The equipment that they had to deal with, again, all armies have issues with their equipment, but on the French army, they seem to have more than most. Uh, the, the way I always look at it is just look at the water bottle. The water bottle to me encompasses a lot of the issues in the fact that they had a water bottle that could only take one litre at the start of the war. So imagine you're going into battle and you've only got one litre of water or pinar wine uh, mm-hmm. to go on. Well, you're very quickly going to go through that. And there's so many stories out there. And guess what? Uh, when I say stories out there of people having to drink out of shell holes. There's one that I, I read recently about two soldiers. They were so thirsty. They were drinking out of a shell hole with, with, with a corpse that was decomposing in it. And then you wonder why there was such massive um, typhoid outbreaks within the French army in 1914 and 1915. And that's solely, in a way, down to that water bottle. Another weird element of that water bottle was that it used to rattle as well because it wasn't fixed to the soldier. And you kind of think that's not great, if you, especially if you're going on patrol and you've got a rattling water bottle. But the French army didn't kind of see the need to fix it. And ironically, when I say fix it, they actually only fixed it. Uh, I think it was in 1936 or something like that. It took that long for them to kind of work out such such a fundamental problem. But, I mean, the, there's also another reason why these Poilus, the name Poilu came into being, but why it became synonymous with the look of being hairy, ragged, is because also because of their equipment. A lot of their equipment was coming from home. It was people sending, uh, well, to some extent, fur coats, as uh, as I've got photos of. But in other cases, for example, with Jules, it was the police sending him a waterproof because he didn't have one. So when you're doing a watch and you're out there in the pouring rain, well, you're just getting soaked. Well, I, it would be great to have a waterproof. Didn't have one. So it was the police that would uh, provide that with them. Socks, they didn't have enough socks. He got to the point where he's walking around with newspaper. He's using newspaper as socks because he, he didn't have any socks left. So there's elements of that. That, that just kind of ingrains what life I- is like. And then with that, you had the problem of your equipment, but also your uniform, which were then obviously wet. You've got the element of fleas as well, the famous tutu as they call them in France, well, that was just a problem constantly uh, for the for your average average soldier. I, I'm using the word average soldier here because we're talking at somebody who's a who's a sergeant in the army. So he's kind of your average soldier, but with a little bit above. But he's not getting he's not getting the silver plate service that you get when you're an officier right. in, in that respect. So there's that element. You then got the food. The food, you everyone who says France, they think straight away food is going to be great. It's going to be amazing. No, wow. uh, this was you surprising. think France. Yeah. yeah, you think France. You think bread. You think the baguette. Well, France during the war they had the famous pain de guerre, so war bread. It it sounds nasty. It was nasty. Um, there was there's a, there's a quote from uh, l'illustration magazine uh, newspaper, which they call which where it says we ate the bread, but sometimes we broke we broke a tooth on it. I mean that kind of gives you an, an idea of the quality, and it got nicknamed by the soldiers uh, pain de galère, the bread of nightmares. 
<laughs> which I think says says everything. So that's just your bread. Um, they didn't even get. They didn't even have any wine at the start. So at the start, there's no wine rations that only came um, late in 1914. That wine rations uh, were provided to them, and then when you're actually in battle, you want to at least have something to eat. And you, when you look at, for example, when he's in Verdun, places like that, they've got nothing to eat. They're living off bits of uh, chocolate and sardine cans. Yep. And that's pretty much it. And then when food does arrive, oh, it's arriving in bags which were previously hauling soil. So guess what? Their food is covered in soil. Yep. I mean... It's not really very appetizing <laughs> in oh. that respect. No, and then it seems like an afterthought of like, oh yeah, I guess we have to feed these soldiers too, right? You know, like correct. It's... And you have got the element they have popots, so these popots, which are these mobile um, kitchens. But in places, for example, like Verdun, a popot you had to go five, ten, five kilometers maybe. And in Verdun, in, in an artillery battle, the last thing you want to be doing is exposing yourself and walking off to go and get some hot food. So it, it was completely useless in that sense. And another element that comes across in every letter from soldiers is the monotonous routine. The monotonous routine of being in the front lines, but in the reserve lines, being at rest. It's just the constantly doing the same thing over and over and over again. It even gets to the point where when they do have days off, they don't even know what to do. And actually, they find it a bit depressing in that sense because it gives them too much time to think about their lives and what's actually what's happening um, at that time. And you think about the monotonous routine. So the one thing, what do you have to look forward to? Well, you've got to look forward to your leave. But even that was complex and also very in. Uh, it, was, it was completely unjust in how it was set up. It was only after uh, the Chemin des Dames and Pétain. Um, coming on board that he changed the pay he changed the leave because leave previously if you were single and you didn't have any kids put it this way you weren't going to be going on leave anytime soon and wow leave, leave was basically done by the whim of your company commander he could decide to shut it down for no reason uh, at times because i've got letters where there's no real reason why leave would be stopped. And for some reason, it has been stopped. And even he gets exasperated by this guy. Leave us stop again. We, we don't know why. Um, now, Alex, was this, this um, you just mentioned that like, hey, if you're a single soldier, no family, like you're not, you're not getting leave. Was this in a, a I guess I'm, I'm going to ask this dumb question. Was this an official policy or was it just one of like it it was not an official policy, but it's just like this is how this is how it's done. And, so, and no, there was an official policy which was hierarchy. It was done with a hierarchy. Okay. So it was done by your amount of experience. So how many years you had been in the army. But then also then you had, for example, if you were married, if, for example, you had kids and all of that it would blend into this hierarchy but no one was really too sure which one was the priority and that would change by whoever actually was leading your company or your battalion but i, I actually there was something that he wrote in the letter around his leave periods and this was at the tail end of 1915 where he writes that we should be having three leave periods of seven days a year wow but he writes at the moment there is one person leaving every five days. So if you do the maths on that when in a company with around 200 to 250 people, put it this way, you're, 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 you're going to be waiting a while to get your leave. Right, right. Oh, man, that's awful. And, and to be left to the whims of your, of your local commanders. And, and um, I've read that, I think it was in, in Alistair Horne's book on, on Verdun, the originally published in the 1960s, that um, at the beginning of the war, the French army suffered you know, horrific losses of, of trained officers. So they rapidly promoted a lot of uh, non-commissioned officers, which is that in French, is, is that the, the sous-officier, the, the non, like the sergeants? Yes, yeah, so you, you, so you have like your, your, what you would call your, rank and file 
and then you've got sous officier, and then uh, so your sergeant up to, and I believe, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's lieutenant and sous lieutenant, and then after that, when you hit capitaine, that's when you become officier. Um, it could be the gap. The gap could be a bit different. Um, I'd actually need to relook at my uh, my spreadsheet where I've got it sure. wrapped out. <laughs> sure, no, it's not, it sounds like you've got it right. So, so in in you know with with the losses of so many officers, a lot of these sergeants you know were were promoted into into lieutenants and captains. And um, the way Horn put it in his book was that these guys became pretty um, pretty focused on keeping staying officers. So that mm -hmm. meant keeping their men in line. And so you know the I think like the 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 mass punishments of of like you know stopping leave and stuff like that. If, if you're you know you guys are really aggravating me, I'll shut <laughs> off all your leave. And uh, so that so that sort of situation, like you know, hu humans are human, you know. And yeah. war brings out the best. It it also brings out the worst in people. So like I could I could like just seems like a lot of that was left to very local conditions to where you get one guy on leave every five days and like I'll I'll never I'll you know, I'll, I'll be killed out here before I get on leave. So yeah, and the only thing that the way I kind of look at it, not to try and be too negative about their life, the one thing that did actually, and was the glue I always say that held the French army together, was the postal service, because that that when that was not working, or letters were not arriving, you can tell, and this is not just with. Um, with Jules, but in loads of other letters that I've read from people within the same regiment, but others as well, the aggravation and the, let's say, the depression that starts to set in is huge. Mm -hmm. When they're not getting letters, not having that connection back to their friends, families, loved ones is massive. And that, I always say, if, if it wasn't for a postal service and the postal service, to be fair, stepped up massively in in france I, i've been reading a lot about it recently and in 1914 so in, in the early part of the war there were 60,000 letters that were were going a day in 1914 by the time you hit and i think it was april 1915 there was 250,000 letters that were going daily wow that's a, like a 400 percent increase right and then i think it was on the 30th of december 30th December 1915, the French Postal Service handled 5.2 million letters in one day. Stunning. Wow. So you can see how it's gone from this low level. And at the start of the war, the Postal Service, it was breaking. It was falling apart. And it was only because of the reforms by Matty um, in 1915 that it regained that well, number one, legitimacy, because soldiers were kind of go, if I send a letter, I'm, I am going to get it and I'm going to receive it within a decent time period, time frame or time period. And then you can see that it becomes the glue. It is the glue that holds holds a, an army together. You don't have that. Morale goes south very quickly. And you get what um, what French soldiers, I believe, they would call that situation, Les, les Cafards, the, yep, the blues. Correct. Right. So the blues is, and my grandfather my great grandfather talks about it a lot he for him the cafe was was sunday it, it was okay. he didn't like sundays he didn't like sundays because he felt as though on a sunday where well, he didn't have anything to do so it meant he had too much time to think and that meant that he'd think about home he'd think about what he's lost and what uh what he's having to do at, at the moment so he often would talk about it but yeah the cafe you could he, he would also use it in other occasion where he just the black cloud um, in that sense has come over him. Wow. 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 So he's got all of that to face. Okay. And, and he, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not making it, we're not making it sound particularly uh, attractive. We're not, there's not going to be too many applicants, <laughs> but this is, yeah, no, you know, you know, which is why you have conscription and not, you know, volunteer. <laughs> Um, so we haven't even gotten to the front line yet, but, but now <laughs> here we go. So, um, so yeah, so Jules joins the fourth battalion of the 315th regiment after it is for all intents and purposes shattered on the battlefield, uh, in the September, 1915. And this was the, the, the second battle of the Champagne, according to the French, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, so 
it, I was looking up uh, on Google Maps, uh, Alborive, and um, man, I was like, you know, bloody hell, man! I was I was just I was just east of there this past summer. I was at um, Blanc Mon and and um, Neverin Farm and that yep. area. And, um, so I was like, ah, oh, I wish I'd known. I would have, you know, I could have just gone like ten minutes and probably would have would have visited this this area. Um, but what happened to the 315th uh, at the uh, second battle of, of Champagne? Well, what what happened? I mean, it got pulverized. There's no really, there's no real other way of, of kind of looking at it. Um, just to kind of like cycle back to, to what you were saying, the second Champagne is interesting because actually Auberive was on the extremity of it. So okay. it was a 25 kilometer front from Auberive to ville sur tourbe which ironically are all places he would go to. Um, so you got that 25 kilometer front, started obviously on the 25th of um, September, 1915. And it went on, let's say to the 6th of October, but let's be honest, it kind of petered out very quickly. It's all part of uh, Joff's big offensive and mm. the land itself, in terms of the train, it was actually the Castelnau, that kind of decided this is where we're going to go. This is this is prime terrain uh, to attack. But being obviously on the extremity in Auberive, whenever you look at any maps of Second Champagne, Auberive is kind of this little thing stuck on the left. Okay. And and everyone's kind of like, well, nothing happened here, <laughs> which is not really the case. Right. Um, because you had just for the three one five, the number of ca casualties just on one day. Uh, 1,460 estimated casualties. Of that, around about 492 dead My God. in one day. When you take into account that it was about 1,800 soldiers that attacked, that's, that's, that, that's not pretty good ratio. Um, that's not where you really want to be. Um, the 4th Battalion, they accrued around about 700 casualties. So you can see why that it needed, obviously, to be reinforced. What's even more, let's say, shocking, but also not shocking in, for example, French army history throughout the First World War is the number of losses on the officer side. So they had 11 officers, nine of them dead. In the, Nine dead, the two others wounded, put out of action. The only now, person that survived was the medic. Wow. Quick, quick aside here. Nine out of 11 officers killed or 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 died you know yep. uh, that is a result of wounds on that day i look at that and based on what i've read from the first world war that to me tells that like french officers are are leading from the front and and they're right up there when when those first rounds of machine gun bullets start punching into people am, am i correct in that like yeah yeah it's very much that and read it and i've actually been you missed out on going to Auberry, but I went to Auberry uh, this uh, this August, and actually, it's a fascinating place because it's a farmer's field now. The front line, well, the French front line, the German front line, and no man's land, and because we don't have too much on the technology side for the French battlefield, you don't have things like linesmen or digitalized um, trench maps on the French side of the battlefield. Hopefully, that's going to change soon. I have to go with an old trench map and try and superimpose it on Google Maps. Yep, I've done that. But I yeah. managed to find the where the front lines were and go into no man's land. And it is full of detritus still. And this is a farmer's field. So he's obviously plowing it. But the amount of metal and shrapnel in the field is unbelievable. But again, it's because it's unknown. Nobody's been there. It's not been picked like in Ypres or the Somme and places uh, and, and places like that. But Going back to kind of the, the officer side, yes, they're very much at, at the forefront. The regimental commander so of the of the 315, he was part of the second wave, he was. So he wasn't sitting back um, in his uh, in his poste de commandement, in his PC. He was in the second wave going forward. Um, the 4th Battalion uh, captain, he was in the wave. He, he died um, very early on. The 5th Battalion, he was severely wounded very early on. These the, the officers are at the front, leading from the front. It's the French Elan, um, the offensive. 
It's all about it's all about being there at the front, showing the example. And again, ironically, the phrase that they will use for obviously when they will shoot people later on, well, not later on, because they did it in 14, 15, 16, 17, for an example, for the example. The example. It's all about the example for everything in, in on the French army. But the 25th, the 315, actually, they did rather well. They they got in, like the story throughout the second Champagne offensive, they very quickly got into the front line. So they they were very quickly into the front line. They even managed to get in very close to the second line. But again, barbed wire was not cut um, when they when they arrived there, and they then got stuck in a kind of a no man's land. And unfortunately, their support on their left and their right from two active regiments, uh, the hundred and second and the hundred and third, was in, in my line of work in software, I would call suboptimal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and yes. uh, they kind of left them a little bit exposed. <laughs> right, right. Wow, man. Yeah. So that day turns out to be um, a, a, a horrible day for the 315th. And actually, now, um, folks, I don't. For you listeners out there, um, Alex and I were speaking about this earlier. Um, typically, the 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 bloodiest day in French history. Uh, in world war one is is known as um august 22nd 1914 during the the battle battle of the frontiers um but there's been talk um that that that's actually may be the the 25th of september in 1915 during these these massive battles because there was the champagne offensive the french launched another attack in the artois region um and these were just horrific um days of of really high casualties you know of, of which the 315th was just one regiment um in that in that battle um so 315th is is depleted they're they're shattered they need to be rebuilt jules gets you know gets called up he gets sent in um he's now going to be a part of the fourth battalion he's just been promoted to sergeant um how does he how did Jules adapt to life at the front? I think he adapted pretty quickly. And I think you have to in, in that respect, but you kind of, you have to adapt quickly, but can you ever really adapt? So there's kind of the, those two elements to it. So when you read the letters, you get the feeling, and he even actually mentions it himself, by the time you hit November uh, 1915, he even says it himself, I, I, I feel as though now I'm more at home. But what's interesting is his October letters are really interesting about, they very much describe, you feel as though it's somebody new because he's talking about the shells are whizzing over his head, which later on, he'll never mention that anymore. But oh, he does at the start. Yeah, it's all going, new. Oh, we've got 75s, which are whistling, whistling over our heads. Oh, we've just got an Adria helmet that's just being given to us. Oh, they're lovely. It makes us feel so safe having having our Adria helmet. So you can see how he's kind of a bit of a greenhorn, as they would say at the start. He's green. Um, as the, the French, they got a specific phrase. Uh, I can't remember how they, they called the... Uh, the Bleuet, uh, the, which obviously... The bleu also is used as the poppy um, in France, but that's where how they would call your kind of your younger soldiers. I wouldn't classify Jules as being a pepper. Pepper is what they used uh, for your older soldier, but ironically also used in late later on in the war as a for quiet sectors. So I hope I'm going to a pepper sector, which would mean a nice quiet and relaxed sector. Oh. Okay, like like where where the old folks would go hang out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the and that that that's also something fascinating. The language used in the French army during that time, when you're reading letters, and you read, the Germans are throwing saucepans at us. You're like, you sorry, what? They, the the Germans are there's there there are malmutes coming at us. A malmute in French, if you translate it from French, means saucepan, but. <laughs> Actually, during the war, it was actually used for heavy caliber shells. <laughs> right. So there's loads of things like this where you can be going, somebody's throwing saucepans at us and I'm eating monkey because right. bully beef in French was singe. singe. So you can read things and go, wow, uh, what is going on here? 
<laughs> so yeah so in terms of the adapt adapting to it i think he probably had to adapt also to the language as well because again your language when you're in your caserne and in reserve and at the front obviously rather different but as i said at the start did you really ever adapt uh to really being there and i mean the example i always use is from the 25th of december um 1915 and it's a letter that's written in the early morning, but this happened at 1 a.m. So 1 a.m. Christmas Day, where he arrives back to his shelter and the lieutenant wants to see him. And he writes that he's just walking away from his shelter. And as he takes no more than 100 paces away, a German 105 shell hits and destroys his shelter. And that kind of just brings the reality of what the war is. But really, can you really ever adapt to that type of situation no not really it's just so random you know yeah it's, it's so out of out of almost out of anyone's control once that shell leaves the tube you know so <laughs> wow wow can we can we do a quick aside here so because i want to talk about french soldiers names because um uh alex i hope you don't mind me sharing uh you have you have a working manuscript of of the of your great grandfather's experiences, and in it you break down the names. So, up until like yesterday, I labored under the delusion that French soldiers were just called poilus, right? Like, and that's yep. what. They, and I I knew about the the term um, biffin, the the rag pickers. Yep. Um. Okay, but I thought, oh yeah, they they would say, hey, I, I was a poilu. But it turns out poilu was more used like in the newspapers like our glorious poilus are are at the front they actually had a whole bunch of other names for them so um so would you mind just telling us a few of those like there's this there's one especially for the young soldiers that i that i really liked (laughs) and i i don't know if i'll if i can do the pronunciation justice so yeah you've got you you, you've got a lot of them and again this uh, a lot of this comes actually david omar um, who obviously sadly uh sadly died uh earlier this year and who was obviously a great help to many of us um out there um he he wrote a lot about this in in one of his book the um one i think it was his second book um on the somme in terms of the french on the somme and as you said, the word poilu is weird because it's got, where does it come from? It means hair in French, but mm-hmm. because in French, hair has always been associated with bravery. There's the element of also les trois poils uh, from a French, um, I believe, if I'm correct, it was from a Moliere um, play. You've also got the element, if you go further back and you want to look at Napoleonic times, you've got the grognards, who are these hairy soldiers again it's the element of hair 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 which kind of follows the whole trend and then you've got all these other weird and wonderful names so you've got your biffin known as kind of your rag picker you've got the pitou uh for the uh or pew pew as the <laughs> young sh- soldiers it, it's like these weird terms and what i find great is how what actually how they address themselves because a lot of them hated the word uh poilu. There's, they they thought it was actually derogatory. It made them sound like animals, etc. Interesting. Themselves, they used to they love. Again, it's like like any army. It's like any work environment in that sense. They had a bit of camaraderie in terms of how they called themselves. A bit of also sarcasm as well. Mm-hmm. So they would often call themselves les bonhommes. So the lads. They'd also ironically call themselves the PCDFs. So that means les pauvres cons du front, which is the poor bastards of the front. And <laughs> honestly, sitting here and and obviously be able to speak French and knowing how the French would talk about and imagining these things, I can just imagine them saying that, you know, just sitting there going, nous les pauvres cons, on est, on est toujours ici. And you can just imagine it there whilst they're just sitting there, just groaning and, mu- and just just mulling over uh what what has become of their lives yes. so yeah it's it's fascinating yeah. oh my god that's so that, that was such an eye-opening thing and, and again it's like it's a it's a it's another like window into this world that like so many so many of us in the english-speaking world like we don't have unless someone like yourself 
opens it for us you know like so so really appreciate that thank you so, so much pew pew like i'm never like i'm because it always sounds like like a little like cap gun too like a little kid so i think that I, that's probably where it's come from uh <laughs> again with all of these anything that you have in terms of i've actually got a book somewhere on the shelf here which literally is about is about this thick which is where all of these terminologies have come from but it, nobody can also agree at times there's multiple right. different why reasons why for example why singe was called singe there's about three or four different uh, reasons it seems like the most obvious one was the fact that uh, soldiers when they're out in africa they were seeing the locals eating this meat mm -hmm. which was monkey meat and when they were then seeing their first tin meat they were like well this looks like the monkey meat we saw them eating that's where it came from um so yeah it's it's bizarre it's bizarre all these weird terms you can imagine how you, if we were parachuted in there now we would sit there and go what are these people talking about right it's a whole other world yeah yeah, yeah. and it would take you a while to to pick up yeah yeah definitely um so jewel where where else did he serve he's at all bereave he's at view via Sertub in the um in the champagne front um but he served in other places uh notably um Verdun as well so um so we've got Champagne Verdun where else where else did he serve um and at one point he's wounded and then this is a lot of questions man so I apologize but like once he's wounded does he go back to the front or is was his wound of such a nature that he was finished with with the war yeah so he he basically did a sightseeing tour of all the big all, all the big names of the of the of the French uh, of, the, of the French army during the First World War. Um, the one well the one which I said well he missed what well, I want to say missed out on but didn't go to but there was a lot of rumours they were going to be going to there was the Somme which he never actually he never went to but he started off with Auberive so he did a a couple of months well did just a month in Auberive and then after that they got shifted down the front uh, literally to the other end of the uh, of the tw of the uh, offensive out to ville sur torbe which was a quiet enough area but horrendous in the fact that it was basically a marsh it was very swampy uh, the weather was awful whilst they were there i mean you've seen some of the photos that i've posted with yes. them wearing their waders in knee high water there's rats everywhere You've got trenches which are constantly collapsing on themselves because of the weather. So not particularly, not, not particularly where you want to be going on holiday anytime soon. And then after that, they moved. To, then they shift. Then a little bit further back down the other side, they go to a place called Mezancourt, but it still it still has the same characteristics of being rather swampy. Uh, so they spend most of end of 1915 and up until you know, april 1916 in these very swampy not particularly nice uh, areas uh, to be to be serving then after that um they carry then they move back to torbay again so you're kind of rotating all in this same area then after that then they get moved up the hill literally because then they go up to massage so okay. torbay is right next to Massage, and when you visit there, you actually go through Ville sur Torbet to actually go towards uh, Massage. Okay, and then he goes and serves uh, for during the summer, so from end of June to early August at Massage, and does all the different areas. When I say areas, little subsectors. So you've got the Veru, the Crater, uh, etc. He go he they, they, he see, he seems to end up in all of these different subsectors, and ironically. Uh, where the uh, Massage Association, which if people don't know, are, I want to say recreated trenches, but actually all they've done is just re-dug the old trench lines um, within its, fa its fascinating site to, to see. Well, these are places where he, 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 he was. He would have been walking in those areas because that's exactly where they were serving. They weren't, it wasn't a particularly nice tour because in that, sector the german line was very close and it was so close that they could throw grenades at each other so it was it was a very let's say hot not particularly quite dangerous as a lot a lot of uh, wounded uh for uh, whilst they're at Masid, just because of grenade just randomly being thrown 
a lot of artillery being being used as well. So that was not particularly a nice period. Uh, though the one advantage they do have within the siege is they did have large underground shelters, obviously dug into the hillside. So that was a, an advantage for them. Then after that, they have the, let's say they draw the short straw and they go to Verda and they go in September 1916. That's where the French were obviously on the front foot. They're moving, starting to regain a lot of territory. The 315 participate in a couple of attacks um, at Verdun, not particularly successful uh, attacks. A lot of wounded and, and dead from it, unfortunately. He survives that period. I mean, he spent 12 days in the Verdun, pretty much, well, it was around 10 to 12 days uh, in the Verdun front lines, which are some of the worst conditions you can probably want to want to be in because number one the one characteristic of Verdun is there's no real trenches so okay. everyone thinks about obviously the first world war and goes trenches uh, Verdun was very few because it was a moonscape of just shell holes mm -hmm. the trenches were basically trench well shell holes connected together yeah yep. and the living conditions there were horrendous i mean there's one soldier ironically in exactly the same company as him uh who wrote that the smell of de decomposing corpses just stuck in your throat and was talking about having views in front of him of bodies piled up on the top of each other um yeah it's not it, it you can tell by him as an individual, by the time he fit, he's finishing, coming to the end of his time at Verdun, after those 10, 12 days, even he, as a police officer, and very kind of restrained, is basically going, I've, I've, yeah, I need to, we need to get out of here, and just need to get out of here in one piece, because wow, we've been losing so many people. Uh, then after that, they go to rest, they have another rest period, then they get the joy of being told they're going back to Verdun again for a second wow. tour, Second tour, so they've done two tours. There's some regiments out there in the French Army. They did five tours of Valda, which is uh, pretty pretty horrendous. But this tour, they were less in the front lines. They were doing a lot of second line, a lot of work was being done around preparing for later offences and rebuilding certain trenches and, well, trying to rebuild some, some trenches. But the conditions were awful. There was a lot of rain. You're in November. It's cold. He gets yeah. a bout of trench foot. It gets a couple of days out. Um, he does spend a night at Fardourmont after it's been captured okay. on the 1st of November. And ironically, I found a piece of paper in the French archives a couple of uh, a month or so ago uh, with his name written on saying that he'd stayed at uh, stayed at Duomo, at Fardourmont, along with a, a lo a, about 30 other soldiers. They'd been left in the fort for a night. And I was like, oh, yeah, but I also have the letter that says that as well. Um, so, again, it's, it's great being able to put that synergy together. Seriously. But, and then he gets wounded on the 14th of November. So he gets uh, a piece of shrapnel in the, in the head and and then also in the shoulder at first he kind of thinks he just dislocated his shoulder but actually transpires he's got a broken shoulder um and then the head he's got a head wound from it but that's not obviously the most serious the more serious is the broken soldier and then gets carted off to hospital and has a good couple of months uh, away from the front to recuperate from there he then rejoins back up in january time with the 315 spends a bit of time in Lorraine region of France. Okay. Then they carry on their tour of famous French World French World War battlefields because they end up then at the Chemin des Dames. After they, they end up there after the offensive. So in that sense, uh, small blessing, but again, not a great sector to be in. Huge amounts of shelling, huge amounts of people constantly being... Um, wounded it's a theme that you get lots of wounded just wounded 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 because of just 1916 1915 even 17 these artillery there's so much artillery being used and the shrapnel these are just out there to kill people i mean you can see a piece just over my shoulder yes of a, yep of a, that's actually from Valda. 
Uh, is it really? Yes, a piece of a 75, wow. um, which is, uh, well, you can see it's kind of half smashed uh, yeah. 75 casing. And so then they're in Chemin de, Chemin de Dame. So they stay there around Ostel, uh, Soupy, all these names which are, people are, are familiar with when you when you read up on the on the Chemin de Dam. And then after that, the regiment gets dissolved <laughs> on the fifth of fifth uh, of December. For him, he then gets carted off um, to a new regiment. So he then goes okay. to the two hundred four. He then gets gassed in nineteen eighteen oh, at okay. Guni. So he gets gassed in August. He then has a period of convalescence. Then he ends up in the 6th uh, Regiment um, in October uh, 1918, then earns a citation on the Canal uh, de Sambre in November okay. 1918. On the night of the 4th and the 5th, he actually gets a divisional citation uh, for holding a, well, preventing a bridge from being uh, blown up by the Germans, which is his second citation uh, of the war, but because it's a divisional one, he gets himself uh, a silver star on his Croix de Guerre. Wow. So for a man who, you know, again, as we mentioned earlier, military was not his thing. He did what he had to do. But again, showing he did what he had to do, like he did his job and even went above and beyond, you know. And, um, and that's exactly it. In the letters, he says often, I'm not here for medals. I'm not here for promotion. I'm just here to do my job. And I think one of the most eye-opening letters in a way is his one just before he goes to the front where you, it dawns on you that he knows that this is potentially the last letter he writes because he's going to the front. Yeah. But also it's very realistic in the fact that he's going, you know what, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I, Yeah, I'm here to do my duty. You know, this is our duty. This is what we have to do. I'm, I'm going to go and do it. And to think at 26, would I have been able to write that at 26? Probably not. No, I, I don't think I would either. I, mm. <laughs> I, can't look, I can't look back very fondly on myself at 26. Like, <laughs> there's, a, there's a fair amount of selfishness in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you mentioned that in it, this kind of like went right into my uh, second to last question here was talking about the, the 315th being dissolved in December of, of 1917. Uh, Jules gets, um, he gets shipped off to the 204th regiment yep. uh, at first. So did he go alone or did like just a bunch of guys, a bunch of the 315th guys go with him? No, so they got dissolved. So they got dissolved on the fifth of December seventeen, and it wasn't just them. There was also the uh, the two hundred twelfth regiment that got dissolved as well. So both of them got dissolved. The reason was is to resupply other regiment with men, yep. because as you can imagine, the French army had been losing a, a large number of men. I mean, when you end up at the end of the war with France with one point just shy of one point four million dead. I mean, it, 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 these are huge figures. When you think, and I always like, especially for the English-speaking audience, I always like put it into context, go, at that time, the French population, the British population was exactly the same. Mm. And you look, at the Brits lost, and well, it's British and Commonwealth, it was around, I think, is around 700,000. Mm -hmm. The French double. Yeah. And that's why I always say to people, you need to understand that to then understand why what happened to france later on with the second world war you can understand yes. when your country has gone through so much in terms of the loss of manpower why something like the maginot line makes sense to a country like that and and i remember a, um there's a statement um in, in some history book somewhere that i read of, of a french soldier saying talking about verdun and saying like you can only ask us to do something like this once yeah that's yeah. all we've got you know so you, you can understand like when when world war ii came you know like again we're we're gonna we're gonna sacrifice another million and a half like i i i mean no disrespect but it's like i can almost understand like like we can't do that you know so yeah. um tough tough situation um really really just dark times and um boy like when I think of like when people talk about like there's a phrase I'm I'm increasingly 
disliking over over the years as i get older is the good old days like like what what good old days man world <laughs> war one and world war two or or like, yeah. like dying of like i don't know dying of diarrhea you know back in like the 1500s those times are awful man <laughs> you know like the good times are now <laughs> so yeah, yeah exactly and i think <laughs> i mean I, I, the one thing i do look at is i always kind of and it's a shame that we don't have any letters from when the regiment was dissolved. But what we do have are some letters when he, his company is pushed to depot. So he starts off in the 16th company, mm-hmm. but part way through 1916, it gets it gets shunted off to depot, and he then gets put into the 14th uh, company. And that's interesting reading those letters because for him, it's like a breakup with his family. He's like, right. I'm losing, right. I'm losing my comrades. I'm losing my commanding officers uh, who I get on well with. This is, we're all really sad. We're going in with strangers and we, so you can imagine what it must've been like for a lot of the, a lot of these men. They did, to be fair to the French army, try and lump large amounts of men to the same regiment. So for example, he went to the 104th. There's a lot of other men. When I say a lot of others, there's around about 550 men went to the uh, four, uh, 204th. Then there was around 600 odd that went to the 289th. And then you got the 246th who picked up around 350. So they weren't just throwing men, just one man to, to a regiment. They tried to at least push a sizable number uh, into these into these new, uh, when I say new, pushing them into reinforce these other regiments wow wow so jewel survives and then just uh, did he did he go back to being a, a police officer and married had children so yeah so pretty much that he he survived uh so he literally just swaps his adjunct helmet for a kippy uh, in that in that respect and so yeah he survives interestingly i have in a couple of documents i i've seen that he got injured on the 12th of november 1918 really okay which i then pulled his service record up and it's not mentioned on there but it's in it's in his in in a couple of his documents there's there's this 12th of november that turns up so it's again that's something for me to dig into uh, to work out why that why that is the case but yes he gets de 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 mobbed as they would call it in 1919 and then go straight back into the police force and stays with the police force. And then he he finally gets his obviously wish to marry uh, to marry Jeanne. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I can imagine Jules coming back and probably for the I, I would probably I would take a guess for the rest of his life, really appreciating everything he had around him, you know, based on like what he realized like when he was in the service like what he couldn't do what he was missing out on what he didn't have access to Mm. coming back post-war being like oh my god like this town is great my my wife is it's so good to be with her with family you know a warm house not being out in the rain all day you know just little things like that you know i can i I can imagine he would but you can imagine why why a lot of them just wanted to then suppress the what they'd been through because yes. they're like you know what i i'm i'm now nice and comfortable here i i don't want to go back there or have to rethink about these things yeah yeah wow wow what a fascinating story so alex you um i've got the final question here is so you're on twitter putting this stuff you know putting these letters the cross-referencing of the details the maps the photographs it's awesome do you have other plans for your future like because if you're writing a book man like sign me up and just go ahead and take my money right now because it's i'm I'm buying a copy man so well that's that's great to hear at least i know one person might read it uh hopefully my wife might read it as well and uh, i'm sure my mom would would always read it so (laughs) yeah but uh I mean, what what the plans are? I mean, I've got um, I've got an article that's going to be coming out in the Great War Group um, in blah, 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 I think it's summer next year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jean Verdun specifically. So it's looking, it's using his letters from Verdun 
and also another soldier who's in the same company, his letters as well. Ooh. And being able to like follow 12 days with them in Verdun and how both of them are writing. And they all write at the same time because obviously they both at the same time have time to write and things like that. And it, it gives a really great view of two individuals, how they see different things as well. How, for example, Julie is a lot more kind of matter of fact and more subdued and doesn't want to alarm people mm -hmm. compared to Hervé, who is the other soldier, is more like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Um, right. Really going, this is, oh, my God, this is, I, yeah, you can really, you really get a sense of two different people, but you can kind of also imagine what it really was like um yeah. there so that i've got that coming out in that's that will be uh in uh i think it's i think it's due out in summer um 23 and as you said bit by bit uh we are slowly but surely making uh month by month progress on a book uh but there's no real timelines on when it would uh would come out what i'm trying to do with it is i don't want it to be your normal diary slash account of a war where I'm just giving you these are the letters and postcards and then you go and try and work out what the hell a half of this means and make it completely inaccessible to the English speaking audience. Yep. I want it to be something where when he mentions something, I want it, I want to explain it to people. I want people to know when he talks about Adrian helmet, what the hell is it? It wasn't some guy called Adrian. It was a helmet. Where does it come from? Uh, give people a bit of detail about things. It's the same. The bread. Why was it called Pangea? Right. These kind of, as they say, tidbits of information that people hopefully can read and go, oh, wow, this is this is giving me a better understanding of that army. But also at the same time, it's kind of trying to give a voice to that regiment as well. Because the 315, as I've been going through this, you look at it from the eyes of my great grandfather, but you also have to look at it at those guys from that regiment. It's a reserve regiment. And often these reserve regiments in France are very much forgotten. There's no mm -hmm. memorial for them. You go to Auberive, guess who's got a, uh, a monument there. It's not them. It's the 102nd uh, that's got one there. So, it's it's one of it's one of these where it's also trying to give a kind of a voice, but also tell their story in that respects as well. Because I think it's a shame if I was them and you go through something like this, I, I'd I'd want people to kind of know the hell that, that we've been through and at least have a voice um, at some point. So I'm kind of like I feel as though I'm in a position to be able to give them that voice, and why not? Oh my God, and that, I think that's such a fantastic re a reason. I I um I'm reminded of on the Somme. There's a village uh, called Mo Morepa, and um the French soldiers used to call it like Malrepa, like like bad meal. Uh, <laughs> it was a nasty place to be stationed, and like but but like those little details, like they either like they just exist in to to the French speaking world. Um, mm. And, and you don't get that context, you know, unless it's like explained to you. So you taking the time to explain little things like that to to us and, and to the, the future readers of of uh, of your book, like that's that's going to be so great. And, and it'll give a voice to these to these guys like these the little stories, the little jokes that that only they would have gotten. They 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 live on longer, you know. <laughs> So, and, and there's great uh, little stories that come out from from just reading these things. I mean, one funny one that I was reading is when they're in Tourbet was around the <laughs> the Germans start putting pl um, placards in the in no man's land, and they're writing all these things. Oh, the war's lost! And then one of them is a caricature of a French cockerel that's got a ball and chain round his neck, <laughs> and. Then you read this, and then you read in the regimental diary where there was a placard. It was then swiftly removed by the by by the uh, three one five regiment, and you kind of sit there and you kind of sit there. And go, I wonder who went out, who either threw a couple of grenades or took right. pot shots at it, or actually physically went out there and and hauled it down. 
actually how did that go about in terms of that taking down of that oh, just man. that that placard seriously yeah yeah because you know yeah because you're talking about like stones man <laughs> <laughs> so yeah there's just weird there's, there's things like that and uh so yeah it, it's again no real time frames on on anything it's kind of whenever i get a bit of free time but as you know work gets in the way uh, family yep. gets in the way with, uh, with with children so it's kind of cherry picking those times where you've got a bit of time to be able to do it um but yeah, yeah bit by bit we'll get there awesome man well thank you so much for taking the time out of your now uh getting late evening here uh in the uk thank you for taking time to to come on the podcast um so psyched that you uh, listened to the verdun episodes back in the day because right? that was I was psyched, man. That's the, that's so uplifting for me. Um, but it's great to have you on. And um, and man, I don't know. I've got an idea, though. Like, if you ever want to talk about, like, the French pay system or the French postal system, like, I am here to uh, to nerd out on that stuff. And I'm sure uh, the listeners are are as well. Like, we, we love this stuff. So thanks again, man, for, for coming on the podcast. No worries. Well, thank you very much. And I'd be more than happy to come back and bore people to tears about the postal service uh, or poilu vocabulary or anything like that <laughs> awesome awesome man 